Okay, so it looks like we're starting to get some viewers in here. So I'd love to give a shout out to Jennifer from Maine and Trish from Pennsylvania and Robbie Lou from Indiana and Ronnie from Oklahoma. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, and Karen, so we have two special guests as you guys can see them on the screen now, if you guys wanna wave. Um, we have Laura Crossy and Carl Carlstrom and they are a dynamic duo um, passionate geology enthusiasts and developers of the incredible Trail of Time, which we're going to be virtually walking through today. Thanks for taking the visitors uh, out there to the to the trail, especially so close to Earth Day, which is a special day to us, as you might imagine. You know, it, it is for us here. For some reason, you went to mute, Alyssa. Thank you for letting me know. So <laughs> for some of our usual followers, um, we're doing this a little bit different. So Laura is our host today and I'm on the other end. Um, and again, I am Alyssa Ojeda. I am the Marketing and Public Relations Manager for Grand Canyon Conservancy. Um, we're working a little bit opposite. And so it's so fun. I get to kind of be on the receiving end of just some fantastic information from these two. And really the whole point of this presentation today is to continue our National Park Week, Earth Week, and Trailblazer momentum. And this time, we did our Trailblazer hike on Sunday. We walked the full length of the Rim Trail. And I'm really excited that today we're going to be able to slow down and really share the trail of time with you guys. Um, if you have any questions, please put it in the comments. We're both going to be monitoring them. So we'll try to ask them live. And you guys always know my favorite part, too, is I love to see where you guys are watching from. So if you come at your hometown, that way we can all stay connected virtually to Grand Canyon. So with that, I really am so excited for you two to join us. Can you guys both share a little bit about your background and how you're connected to the Trail of Time? Sure. You know, I, I'm going to step back. I know Carl won't be able to be here for the whole virtual event. So I'll, I'm going to have Carl start uh, in a way, the Trail of Time, in a very real way. The Trail of Time is, is his vision. There are many people along the way and other organizations uh, besides Grand Canyon National Park that played a role. But uh, Park was Carl was the first one to sort of dream this idea up. So I want to turn it over to Carl and just tell you a little bit about what led him to the point of, of saying, hey, we need to do something about the geology uh, of Grand Canyon National Park for the for the American people. <laughs> Yeah, hey, Alyssa, the, the, you know, I'm envious of you being out on the trail and us not being, and I love walking the trail, but it's the, I think it's one of the great undersold hikes of Grand Canyon, you know, people talk about going into the canyon, that's fantastic, and hikes along the canyon, that's fantastic, but here's a, here's a trail with magnificent views that's uh, accessible for wheelchairs and strollers, and, and uh, if you do the whole thing from Yavapai Geology Museum, all the way out to Maricopa Point, it's just a spectacular activity for, for Grand Canyon visitors. And so that's part of it. And then the other thing about it is uh, the science, uh, the science literacy part. And as Laurie said, we, we, I started researching in Grand Canyon in the 80s. So that's 35 years ago, I guess. And uh, we, we, we kept making advances. You know, we learned new things about the geology as we research. And yet the interpretation of, of new science and even of old science was not evolving. So we went to the park in 1995 <clears throat> and said, hey, we've got this idea for a walking trail, a timeline. We walk back through time and learn about Grand Canyon geology and, and geology in general. And at that time, Jim Gale was the interpretation chief and, and they were busy building the new um, visitor center. So it kind of got put on hold. They were interested. And then it, by around 2000, uh, uh, Ellen Seeley, I mean, uh, Ellen Seeley and, and Judy Helmick were interpret people and exhibit people. They were interested too, but they were busy with renovating the Yavapai Geology Museum, which we helped them with some. So it wasn't until about 2005 that we got money from the National Science Foundation, two and a half million dollars uh, to work with the park to install this exhibit. It was through the Informal Science Education Division of NSF. And uh, 
Oh, we had all kinds of interesting aspects, uh, evaluation of the exhibit, museum specialists, uh, uh, a advisory committee, work with the park. It was, a, it was a major effort. And so, you know, 15 years after we proposed it in 2010, it finally got installed and, and we ended up doing a lot of it ourselves because the park was busy with trail management and whatnot. But, but the, the idea is, is simple, a timeline, and it's aimed at all audiences. You know, we think this idea of, of uh, you leave the trail with a bit more knowledge than you came in with is the, sort of the, the bottom line. And we love the rocks. And initially the park was hesitant to bring big rocks up out of the canyon, from the canyon to show <clears throat> visitors, but those portals uh, that uh, I, I saw a minute ago in the, in the screen. I can stand back over. <laughs> Look, <laughs> we're really proud of the rocks. And we worked hard with the park to decide how best to display rocks. And the, the portals are so beautiful. They're, they're made from, of course, those are the seating rocks, we call them. The idea we'd have seating circles where people could sit and, um, and rest up from the hike kind of thing. There's a story behind each of those. I, I'll, I'll go into Laurie, I'll go into the stories. Anymore, but there's the portals. And the portals um, are made almost entirely by from Grand Canyon rocks. Uh, there's a few ringers that that basement pedestal, uh, the black bottom of it came from Colorado from rocks of about the same age as the basement in Grand Canyon. Then all those tilted layers, um, came from Grand Canyon, again, except that black one, that came from India, believe it or not. And then the uh, top flat-lying layers uh, are all Grand Canyon rocks. So what it does is it shows you at a glance three sets of rocks, the basement, the supergroup, Grand Canyon supergroup is the tilted layers, and then the Paleozoic flat-lying rocks. And so it's, uh, it was done with care and, and uh, the supergroup's actually only at half scale. So those units are really twice as thick as that. But um, anyway, they're polished. They were made by a, a company called Rock and Company up in, in, in uh, Colorado. And uh, I love those things. There's four of them along the trail, <laughs> one at each of the entry points. And people like to stop and stroke them and talk about them. And anyway, they're, they're one of the things we're really proud of about the exhibit. <laughs> and, and before, listen, before we go, go get, get too much into the exhibit itself, I want to come back to sort of Carl's background in geology. He, he's worked in a research sense, making new advances um, since Eddie McKee uh, long ago as a <laughs> geologist. Uh, Carl has made probably more individual advances with his team, with his students, with his colleagues, with continuous uh, and support from the National Science Foundation to understand more about the Grand Canyon resource, that is the rocks. And every one of the groups has had a major investment, not only that, but the shape of the canyon itself and the incision history of Grand Canyon. So Carl's been involved in all aspects of, of geology at Grand Canyon. So who better to kind of mastermind an exhibit like this that tries to lay things out and connect this idea of deep time, which in a way is the province of, a, of the geosciences. Um, there's of course deep time involved in the evolution of life, uh, but there's so much to talk about with just the life we have that a lot of times you do that without getting into the deep time element. When we look out in space and we look at the night sky, uh, we're looking back in time because the light travels to us. That's another aspect of deep time, but it's not really the first thing you talk about when you're thinking about astronomy. But when you gaze into that beautiful canyon behind you uh, and along the rim trail, you are instantly drawn into thinking about deep time. It's just an incredible visceral experience uh, that people have when they look and then they wonder. So, so um, Lori and I are both professors at the University of New Mexico. Uh, Lori started Grand Canyon research uh, 20 years ago. Or yeah, only 20 years Only ago. 20 years ago. She's kind of new at it, but... <laughs> she, she, <laughs> I'm getting the hang of it. She, what she's brought is a whole nother aspect, which is the water, you know, the springs and the groundwater that uh, are the sustenance of for life and ecosystems in the Grand Canyon and all the visitors too. Um, that's something that we've been actively studying. And like she says, you never, you know, I started working in the basement in the 80s and the super group in the 90s and the, and the carving of the canyon in the 2000s and 
And then the water came along around 2002. And, and, and so you never drop a project, you just keep adding on new research projects. We just got off a research river trip, which, which brought in a whole bunch of students and young professors. And we're trying to, to uh, sort of reach out and say, what's the next generation of research? We feel like we made a lot of progress, but there's so much to learn from the laboratory, the research laboratory at Grand Canyon. And the hope is the trail of time interpretation follows along. Hey, do you, uh, Alyssa, do you have a copy of the, the trail of time companion with you? Do I do? You do? So, uh, so let me spin it around. I'll just say it. There you go. That's so. <laughs> 10 years after we installed the thing, we kind of, we, we collapsed after that for 10 years. <laughs> Not really, but, but uh, 10 years after we installed the trail, uh, we put together this booklet. And the booklet is, it's more than a, a walking guide of the trails. It does a good job of that. But it's really a very up-to-date summary at, uh, at, at, a, at a very understandable level of um, the essentials of Grand Canyon geology. So I recommend it to people. It's got the stories of the rocks as told by the rocks themselves. It's a nice section about, hi, I'm the Kaibab limestone or whatever. And- I'll lean uh, it there so I don't have to. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh. yeah. we, we live in Albuquerque. I did that with a textbook in a classroom. <laughs> my first day teaching at UNM, at the end of class, I gathered my materials and somehow the book has vanished. It was gone. <laughs> we can uh, segue really quick. So this book is available in the GCC stores and it is on our online store as well. Um, and it's a really great guide that has these wonderful maps that kind of take you through, you know, Carl and Lori's process on what it was to build the Trail of Time. So yeah, and the benefits, I'm glad you brought that. The benefits are to keep the maintenance of this, uh, this gigantic exhibit, which has it's weathered pretty well, oh, yeah. but it's practically a geologic outcrop and it does need a little facelift now and then. Maybe kind of like <laughs> some of the geologists that worked on it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're gonna yeah. have to decide as you walk the trail whether you're gonna show all the, there's some missing markers on the trail. We're, we're hoping to go out in July. We're volunteers with the park. Off we think off. of them as unconformities. But the, <laughs> some of the markers have been pried out by unscrupulous visitors and, um, and they need replacing, so we're you know, we're sort of constantly maintaining the thing um, year after year. And you'll see some markers. Oh, there's a beautiful five yeah. five million years ago. Yes, okay. let's go. We'll go through it systematically. Okay. So, all right. Well, <laughs> anyway, that's a brief introduction of us. We're we're committed to keeping the trail going and improving it. Well, I am. Thank you guys so much for that introduction and for virtually joining us from New Mexico today. So I am just going to back up really quickly. So for those of you guys that are watching, if you can't watch the full thing, we will post this to the Facebook page. Um, and then we'll also try and upload a copy to YouTube so you guys can go back and enjoy this as well. Um, and if you guys, again, have any questions, feel free to put it in the comments. I know I missed a couple in the beginning. So we'll go back as we start to walk down and I will show these and answer them. And just want to say thank you guys all again for virtually joining us on this beautiful, sunny, a little bit breezy Friday afternoon. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Lori. Great. So thanks, Carl, for I'm, your, yeah, for your I'm, overview. I might come back in and see how you're doing, but I'll bow out for the moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thanks, Carl. Yeah. So, so maybe we could talk a little bit about the, uh, the mechanics itself. Carl mentioned that we did obtain funding from the National Science Foundation. In order to use those funds effectively, uh, of course, we did all of the things any kind of uh, government would do, you know, government task in terms of bidding. We, we ended up doing a lot of the manual labor, uh, like drilling all 2,500 of those holes uh, on weekends and, and stuff. And I got some of my family that are watching on Facebook, and I'm sure that all of them took a turn <laughs> drilling a few holes in that yeah, tree. Here's Oh, kind of an example don't, don't of the whole sad. Don't show an know. empty one first. Well, there's I did show the end of, one, of but... them, and there's only about five of them this <laughs> I wanted to show how perfectly circular and deep these beautiful holes are that you guys worked so hard to drill. Okay, you mentioned a key thing. This is a timeline. A timeline is what we would think of, especially in Western thinking, as linear. A linear timeline. Yeah. Believe it or not, our genius idea, as we conceived of the trail of time, was to put tick marks just like a ruler, okay? Well, we had this wonderful uh, board, 
And we had representatives from all around, including uh, tribal representatives. And it was a Native American woman who said, you are so linear in your thinking. Time is also <laughs> circular. The markers need to be circular and remind us about the cycles that are so important in time, seasons, days, whatever. I have goosebumps just remembering that, that like switch in our brain going, of course, you know. And then there's the practical side, which is, you know what? It's a lot easier to drill a round hole in asphalt than to make a rectangular hole. <laughs> so that was a twofer. So it really was dual purpose there. It is dual purpose, but you know, we, we do think of time and part of this exhibit, I kind of like to joke, it's about time. <laughs> Number one, after 15 years, we felt it's about time. We had t-shirts made that said, you know, it's about time, uh, but it is about time. And it's about how we think about time. And then it's about time in the natural world and in the geological world. So, so in order to get into deep time, the portal you're standing at right now, if you just lift the, your camera a teeny yep. bit, it says, welcome, you're here, you're on a timeline. It has the word timeline right there in the welcoming uh, bit. And, um, and the first part of our trail, uh, notice there's a map there. Your visitors that come to the park, uh, maybe for the first time, maybe they're getting off of a bus or they took the train from Williams and they, you know, as soon as they get to the rim, of course, there's the canyon, but people get a little nervous even about walking the rim trail. How far am I going? Will I be able to get back? Where's the bathroom? You know, there's all these questions that people have. And look at the percentage of that space right there that's given to a map that just lets people know you're here, you can go here, you can get off the trail here, here's the village. And in fact, the walk of that trail, if you zoom up again a little bit closer, yeah. you'll see the right-hand side says you are here. And then there's the, there's the million year trail will be that first segment. That's the, the, the million year trail is just the very first little part. And then the trail is gonna switch to the main trail, which goes all the way over to Vercamps. And since the earth history at Grand Canyon, the foundational rocks that platform at the bottom of the canyon, those basement rocks, are just under 2 billion years old. So if we have one step is 1 million years, which is kind of the heartbeat of Mother Earth, 1 million years, we're going to go back about 2 billion years. That's 2,000 million years. That's 2,000 steps. If you have a good long stride, it's about a meter. And so wow. the whole trail is, is big, but it's really only two kilometers. And I bet you that you could put a pedometer on. And there's people who walk more than two kilometers on a Sunday morning in a mall, at least pre-COVID, to get their exercise. So it's like walking from one end of the mall back again if you just do the main trail between Yavapai and Vercamps. Whereas it's much wow. longer if you go out, if you go out and you wait at the bus and then the bus has to go out to the road and drive around, it seems like it's really far. The quickest way to get for Vercamps for you right now is to walk at a swift pace down to Vercamps, not to go to the <laughs> bus and go wait. Now if you have a screaming two-year-old or or you're with you know somebody who's not quite as uh, as able then of course you want to take advantage of all those other transportation routes. But our hope with the trail was, you know, we were reading statistics like the average person would, would look at Grand Canyon for about less than five minutes on their typical visit and they spend the rest of that time in the stores and the shops, you know, whatever. So our goal as geologists is let's get them out there and we've got these breadcrumbs, these little markers, they're not going to get lost. They're just follow the yellow brick road one step after the other. And it will lead them and they'll always see how far they have to go uh, and so forth. So that part of it is about the comfort level, making people comfortable. So what do you think? Should I start to walk along a little bit and take it? Yeah, well, just, further? just, just uh, look, look back one second at your portal. And uh, you, Carl mentioned the, uh, the seating rocks. You can just glance at it from a distance. The rocks yeah. that were there are some unusual rocks. These are the very youngest rocks in Grand Canyon. They're not even part of this stack that we think of as Grand Canyon. But at certain places in Grand Canyon, particularly Western Grand Canyon, still in the park, there's actually very young lava flows. So we have some basalts there, columnar basalts, that represent some of the rocks that in a way are decorating the surface of Grand Canyon. So there's beautiful black basalts in Western Grand Canyon. 
Some of them are so young, they actually have potsherds in them. And we have a picture of that on one of the waysides. The other rocks that are there are near and dear to my heart. They're the stone that's produced by groundwater, by springs. It's called travertine. Many people would have this maybe in their bathroom tile or you see it in a <laughs> restaurant or something. But so these are the travertine examples. There are some spectacular travertines in Grand Canyon. Some of them are forming right now at this moment in the LCR, the Little Colorado River uh, at Havasu uh, and at many other side streams. There are places where actually sticks and twigs this very day uh, in 2021 are precipitating and binding material that will soon become fossilized and stored in travertine. So those are two kind of very unusual, very young rocks. And so in our introduction, we put rocks that are in, in many cases less than a million years old, and there they are on the million year trail. So to get people to understand the deep time, we have the million year trail. I think of it as the on-ramp. We're gonna be going with seven league boots if we walk one meters a million years. We gotta think what happens in a million years on planet earth. So go ahead and starting from today, uh, you can start walking back in time. And um, you know, we argued, we said, oh, should we put 2020? Should we put 2019? We were like deciding what year and somebody had the brilliant idea, just put today. <laughs> we're so, so scientific, what year? we're like, which year is it? So you go back in time, maybe you're with a six-year-old, you put your six-year-old on that marker, and then you've got a 12-year-old, you put your 12-year-old on the next marker, and then uh, maybe uh, maybe your, uh, your daughter, maybe those are your grandkids if you're my age, and you keep going and keep going. This wayside kind of suggests that you think about your birthdays of your group uh, and talks about what, what is a million years. So yeah, you can just keep on walking, but the, we're just sort of doing the exercise. You can imagine dropping the people in your group like bread comes and they stand on the markers and you can pretty much walk out to your birthday. You're probably getting close. Let's see here. I just had a birthday a couple weeks ago. Excellent. A ripe age of 30. I talked to a visitor <laughs> who I talked to a visitor on the trail. He was taking a selfie and he was very carefully standing on a marker. And I glanced at it and I thought, geez, that looks like his age. He said, you know what? I come out. I, my parents brought me here when I was little and took a picture of me on my uh, on my marker. And every year that he's at Grand Canyon, he comes and takes a picture of himself on the marker. That's his birthday. <laughs> I got that's a great, great who, trend. Who I love would have it. thought? Who would have thought? But then you keep going, and then you can have, you know, your mom, you know, grandma out there and great grandma. And so then you look back and you see how spread people are. So that's years. That's our own lifetime is measured in years. And then what happens to the markers? If you keep on going to where you're at a hundred, almost to a hundred, yeah, you're gonna see that the markers are gonna change. And I've heard people get very nervous on this stretch of the trail. They say, wait a second, I'm gonna to have to go 2 billion steps to get to the age, but of course- Blue we past have, 100, here we go. Yeah, we have, a, we have a little trick and we switch the scale. So there's 100, now what's the next marker? So 120. You keep, yeah, no, there you go. Okay, keep going again. Okay. I'm at 180, 190. Yeah, so they're going by tens. Years ago. Yeah, so they go by tens, then they go by by hundreds. So we went past then, the tens, then we're past then. the hundreds, and that we're still not going fast enough through time. We got to get we got to get our steps even bigger. <laughs> so we keep going. We talk about history here, some human history, some archaic yeah. tools. This is all stuff that happens in a blink of an eye compared to a geologist. Okay, I mean, there are geologists that work on with archaeologists, of course, but it's not deep time yet. So you keep going, keep going. <laughs> Ale keeps jumping. It has to jump because we got to get all the way up to a million. Wow. And hey, so this, now you feel your speed is picking up. You're taking more time with each step that you go. It feels to me yeah. like you're walking a lot faster now. Now, if you look at, if you look at that rock wayside right there, you'll there was just to your left you'll see that these are some of those very young rocks. Keep, keep going up, keep going up okay, to the waist. Go There's the travertines. And then- uh, and oh, You're then good, thank you though. Sorry. Yeah, and then there's a basalt. See that basalt right there? That basalt is really in that age range right there. And oh, it's so beautiful. Here. Notice I call these the rock stars. We call these rock waysides. This is a traditional wayside sign. 
And on the left is the actual rockway side. And look what we did to the rock. We cut it open and polished it so that you could see into the rock. So that's, that's the idea is that as we go on the trail, now we're gonna to start to see examples of all of these rock layers in their glory. And you'll be able to see them at their birthday on the trail of time. Fantastic. So it looks like I'm coming up here on another portal. You are coming to another portal and this is a major junction. Notice that you're walking on the left side where the markers are on the left side of the trail. I and to make that. people to make people really notice that now that tells you everything that happens in a million years, right? Wow. So congratulations. So we now have look, nice at, look at that diagonal. This, people have a hard time understanding this. But you look at the, the right under your feet. What is that bronze connecting to? Which marker? Right under your feet there. Uh, it's a missing I, one. I know it's a missing one. It's the it's but we the have nine, a million years. Yeah. So the one just before it was 900,000. Okay. Yeah. So that's the one that's missing right at the other end of the, of the thing. But now look at the magic meter. See that on the wayside, but look down on the ground. I see it. Yep. See on the ground. There you go. See where the 900,000 is coming in. And so in one step of 1 million years, you would cross all that time that you just went through on the million year trail. That's just one step. And now wow. we're going back in time at 1 million years each step. And the scale is no longer changing. We've figured it out. We understand the heartbeat of Mother Earth uh, is about a million years. And now you can go on back through the geologic history. So that's wow. kind of what's going on. And believe it or not, only six short steps, 6 million years is, is what it took to carve Grand Canyon. That's just still a very small amount. So let's see, I'm on a million marker right now. So uh -huh. we'll do one, two, three, four, five, six. That was it. The canyon was made just then. <laughs> yeah, only we would start at the present and walk True, back. I went backwards. <laughs> right, yeah, that would be the idea. Like, it's actually those particular six million years. <laughs> okay, you're a good abstract thinker. So, so when now if you, if you look out into the canyon, what you're seeing is what we would say is a young canyon carved into very old rocks. That's one of the main geoscience interpretive points about the Grand Canyon itself. The landscape is relatively young compared to the age of the rocks themselves. So the next rock we're going to come to on the Trail of Time is going to be the top layer of Grand Canyon, that white rock you're standing on. That's the Kaibab limestone. And just as a little tip, that rock's about 270 million years old. So we got to walk a lot of steps just to get to the top rock at Grand Canyon. We really so, do. We really do. And that's going to be a challenge for you because I know you're your uh, your visitors here on Facebook are going to have some other things they might have to go check on their uh, check on their rising bread or their COVID yeah. baking activities or whatever. <laughs> but there's a beautiful polished river rock shows you the power of the river, how it uses tools, it uses hard rocks and sand to polish it, uh, and so it's able to break down even the hardest rocks, the hardest basement rocks, uh, and bring them to a beautiful polish. So that's what it looks like deep in the river. Wow. And, so I do um, want to just um, pause here for a quick second. So for people that do want to go through this um, and walk what I've already walked, I started at Yavapai Geology Museum and I am walking west out towards Ver Camps. And it is, it's a paved path. You know, we wanted it to be accessible. And so if you are walking with a wheelchair or a stroller, it really is something that we want everyone to be able to enjoy. And I think I saw a comment on there too, you know, really trying to make more of these options accessible for individuals so that they can enjoy them too. And I know there was a question in the comments um, about repeating a statistic from Stacy. And let's see, do you mind going back, Laura, and repeating a statistic about the average amount of visitors who spend looking at or interacting with the canyon? Um, she was just, uh, looks like she was blown away by that. It's true, uh, you know, and of course, uh, all statistics are a, a little bit biased. This came from, uh, it's not a direct quote, but you know, as you know, the park uh, 
probably help, help backing the funding of doing these visitor surveys, the Conservancy helps support many of those kinds of visitor surveys. That was a visitor survey that was done during the renovation of Yavapai Museum. Yavapai Museum, you know, is a very small space. And there's 6 million visitors a year now to Grand Canyon. Not all 6 million new visitors can go, you know, in. Even the day's worth of visitors are not able to really fit in Yavapai. So the exhibits in Yavapai are designed so that you can look at it, get a few glimpses, but the idea is move on through, move on through. You can't really dwell in there. So this external exhibit is to help draw people in and give them an, an immersive interpretive experience while they're actually also enjoying the canyon. And so it's designed as an aid recognizing uh, how many people visit the park. It's also set away from Yavapai. It's a little frustrating, like if you don't know where it is, there's a sign that says, hey, go this way. But if we had it start right next to the museum in the summer, there, there can be you know, hundreds of people packed around the outside of that museum and they'd be standing like literally on the exhibit. So we gave it a little space and started it a little further away. Uh, and, and off you go. So you've, you've done that, you've shown people, it's very easy and quick to get to. Now, the, the visitor survey said that the average visitor spent, uh, I think it was even less than five minutes looking at the canyon. Now, keep in mind, people that are on these big buses, you know, when you look at a full day at the park where there's tons of buses, uh, they get off, they look, they, they go into the village and they spend a lot of time in Grand Canyon Village. And so, uh, you know, there's, you know, and, and if they're only going to be at Grand Canyon for like two hours on their way to Vegas, some of those numbers get biased by the visitors that come by bus, in my opinion. Yeah. Lots of people, you know, especially the people on the rim trail, they're automatically spending more than five minutes because they're already out there. But there's people that don't even get to the rim trail. That is so true. You know, Kate, um, one of our kind of top fans, she had just mentioned too that she had saw someone approach the rim take a photograph and then walk away. She says it's probably about 20 seconds. So yeah, or I think all of us. Or, or so. I, <laughs> I was at Grand Canyon, bye. <laughs> See, just, just want to let you know that I was here. Um, okay, yeah. so I had just actually got to the 30 million mark. So I'm now my shadow at this time of day. It's going to be hard to get out of the ground yeah. one. So yeah, you know what, uh, let's say you bring up a really interesting point. So imagine now we've got the space, right? We have this beautiful stretch, which was the park's choice where to put it. That wasn't our choice, but once it, once you're fixed to the point that you're gonna have one meter is a million years, as soon as somebody <laughs> tells you where you can be on one end, you pin it down. We had two choices. We could have the beginning be over by for camps or at the other end. We walked that trail both ways many, many times to say, okay, where are we gonna be at this marker? Where are we going to be at this marker? What's the view going to be? Because we didn't have, we only had two degrees of freedom one way or the other. So we picked the best way we could, but it doesn't always work out perfectly for each rock uh, that you're at a particular point along that trail, but that's, that's the luck of the draw. We also made the option to keep it all handicapped accessible. And as you know, there's parts of the old rim trail that they were not able to make the grade uh, appropriate so that everybody could enjoy it. So when the when the uh, accessible part of the trail takes a sort of a smooth detour around that, we actually yeah. follow the accessible part. That was another choice, uh, which was a pretty much a no brainer. We of course want to want this to be fully accessible exhibit. The other thing yeah. is imagine that you're making an exhibit. It's already pretty complicated because geology, you know, seems to be a little bit complicated for a lot of people. Um, it and it's permeable. I mean, people do in the summer, people just cut through the woods and then they just pop up. Like they could be popping up on the trail right there where you are. And they're right in the middle. It's called a permeable exhibit. So what wow. do we put on the marker so that they even have a clue that they're in an exhibit? So we have, oh, the, big, we have the big ones like that. And what does it say on it? On the top, it says, it says go ahead. The trail of time. Uh-huh. And the bottom says? A geology timeline. That's right. And what do, what, are the, what do the actual words say about the, the time itself? 70 million years ago. That's right. And then the next one is, you know, it's every 10. And then we have what we call the ones or the little ones in between. Uh, obviously, that was less expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so after those first six to carve the canyon, we switched to only marking it every 10 with a big one. 
but there's every one million year there, just like a breadcrumb, you can follow it along. And kids like it's counting, it's units. Uh, there's all kinds of things in there that, uh, that people can work with. So the, the permeability of the exhibit was, was complicated. And uh, the portal rocks uh, at that transition that we went through, which I have as a picture in my background here. This is yeah. the portal that you went through at the, where the Brown's uh, diagonal was. That's that right, portal, right where I started. Yeah, no, the second, the second one. Yeah, the second, second one, yeah. The second one has seating rocks that are from this upper unit. All the seating rocks are from the actual rocks of the layered, the flat line Paleozoic layers. So that made up the pavers were Coconino sandstone. Um, all the seating rocks were different units from up there. We're not gonna go as far today, fortunately for you, <laughs> to get out to the T where you get come to the headquarters trail. But at that oh, yeah. point, the portal there, which people coming from the village or from headquarters would come up that spur, you know, near the um, Shrine of the Ages. Yeah. When they, go, when they come up and they hit the trail there, we, had, we have another portal and we use these angled supergroup rocks that form the seating rocks at that particular portal. And then as you can imagine at the old end of the trail near of our camps, the seating rocks are all the beautiful basement rocks of Grand Canyon, the hard rocks, the igneous and metamorphic rocks. Wow. So, so the portals themselves uh, tell kind of a nice overview story uh, if you do that. And now you're approaching uh, Grandeur Point, I can tell. Such a beautiful mm -hmm. view. It you know, really we were, is. You felt really lucky. What, what 10, what's the nearest 10 to where you're standing now? I literally was standing right on it and I did not even know. 130 go. million years. 130 million. So, so we're not quite to where, um, you know, we're still uh, a, a number of meters away from the youngest rock. Imagine we felt so lucky when we laid this exhibit out that it wasn't right on that curve where Grandeur Point is. We wouldn't have wanted to have marred the experience that say these people are enjoying with sort of a wayside sitting in front of that. You see what I mean? Yeah. So a difficulty with this exhibit was, you know, not everybody who walks the rim trail is there because they want, you know, geology interpretation in their face. So you focused on the portals, which are definitely have a big presence. They have to be big because they're at Grand Canyon. It has to be pretty big or you, you just don't notice anything, <laughs> right? Unless it's a yeah. deer or a condor or a squirrel. <laughs> if it's, it's not alive, good, yes. if it's not alive, people don't notice it too much. And, um, and so, but the rest of the exhibit, including the markers, were designed to be very unobtrusive. That is for both repeat visitors, for people who are there for other purposes. I mean, the rim trail has its own beauty. Uh, you don't have to be thinking about geology interpretation. So it's not really in your face. And of the whole two kilometer stretch, there's only 15 waysides that actually have any verbal explanatory materials, but there's a lot more rock waysides because believe it or not, if you go down to the sub details of these different rock formations, there's almost 50, uh, there's about 50 rock waysides that give people beautiful examples. Wow. So you've gone past uh, Grandeur Point and if you look up ahead, continuing on the trail, uh, yeah. you'll probably start to see uh, up ahead of you is going to be one of the rock waysides. Perfect. I'll make my way up there. And so while I do, you know, I would love for you to be able to share. This is a really comprehensive exhibition. So how long did it take from conception to installation? Well, uh, Carl mentioned he had a he had a, a cartoon idea of the. Uh, of the trail in uh, 1995 presented to the park. And that, that was the very first inkling. We, we sort of formed a team and I should mention uh, some of the team members, of course, Carl and I at the University of New Mexico, but we partnered up with a person who was very knowledgeable about the basement rocks at Grand Canyon. That was Mike Williams, who is presently a professor at UMass in, um, in Amherst. Massachusetts. He'd done a lot of the research work uh, with Carl on the basement rocks of Grand Canyon. And, uh, and then also Steve Semkin, who's at ASU. Steve's specialty has to do with both geoscience education and um, also indigenous uh, science, incorporating indigenous science themes into our view and our presentation of the geosciences, which is something we, we all need to really work on. Here we are on the ancestral homelands uh, of uh, you know the 11 associated tribes of the Grand Canyon region, 
And, uh, you know, we're continuing in the geosciences to uh, struggle to engage, you know, a lot of different uh, people in, in, in that work, but uh, certainly many, many natural resource uh, folks from the tribal units have gone on trips with us. We had folks on our, um, our advisory board as we built the exhibit, and uh, we hope to continue with those kind of connections. So you're coming up to the wayside now. This is the place where I like to say the, the rubber meets the road. This is where the trail meets Grand Canyon, because this exhibit is the actual Kaibab limestone, which is what you're standing on on the trail. The whole trail is on the Kaibab limestone, right? But as we go back in time, we're actually going down in the canyon. So there's a big, beautiful specimen. And then you're looking at the wayside. And notice that again, 30% of that wayside is devoted to the um, showing the person where they are along the trail. Can you point to, the, to where you are now? It, um, it says you are here. It's over on the right. Here, let me juggle my... Yeah, sorry, I know you have a lot of technology, but yeah, it says you're here and it says 270 and it kind of reminds you, see, there's the T junction and then there's our camps to the left. It just kind of keeps you moving along the timeline so that you don't get too scared how far it is to a, a drinking fountain or a bathroom. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so our, one of our points here is connecting the idea of rock layers and geologic time. And that's why there's viewing scopes here. Those are simply guides. If you look through those tubes, they don't have anything fancy in them, no, no magnifiers, nothing. But if you slide it to the notch, which I know is also hard because you have all that technology with you, the notches are pointing to a couple of different viewpoints that are referred to in the wayside. And notice that we have the notch that's, of course, the height that you would be using, but next to it is one for children or for somebody in a wheelchair. And, and the number of times where you see two kids and one of them takes the, the first one and then the other kid goes and runs over to the next tube, it's kind of fun like that, that, that there's two of them there. And so you just look through and it, it helps a guide a person. You know, if I'm standing with you, I'd be pointing and say, no, no, there, there. Uh, and now if you look to the wayside, you'll see that gorgeous Maricopa Point is, is shown in the photo. And on the photo are drawn the different layers from the top down. Uh, and in the photo to your right, there you go. And we've done the explanation of the different letters, like it says Kaibab, because people don't really know how to pronounce all these interesting names, Toroweep. And so every time there's a rock layer, you know, we spell out uh, how to pronounce that word. A lot of times people are just inhibited to say something because they, they feel like they don't know how to pronounce it. Yeah, I think that's a great addition that you guys included there because the words are not just, you know, common everyday language that we use. That's right. That's exactly right. And so look how close together those rocks are actually on the trail. They're yeah. a family right there. The Kaibab, the Toroweep, and the, and the Coconino. Look how close they are in age to each other. And you that's went through all that blank space of geologic wow. time. And then if you look down the trail, we're not gonna really walk further. I don't think you really have time. There's, there's the sandstone down there. Uh, yeah. Then the trail takes a left and follows along the accessible route, but it, you have to go quite a while till you hit the next rock. And that gap you know, is what we call an unconformity. It's a place where the rock layer has missing time. And so even though we see this incredible stack of rocks at Grand Canyon, such a seemingly such a complete geologic history, uh, the analogy of the rock layers uh, at a particular place, the analogy geologists sometimes use is it's like a fisherman's net. A fisherman's <laughs> net is a very useful tool. You throw it out, you catch fish. It's a thing. It's a great thing. But you know what? It's mostly holes. <laughs> and so that's what this is. It looks very complete. But in fact, the amount of time that's actually represented in rock is a very small fraction of the actual time that we walk through. The geologic timeline that you're walking on is the clock was going. Whether it's recorded in rock or not is always a question at each individual places. And geolo geologists have to communicate with people all over the world to put together a picture of what's happened on Earth because we all have gaps. Wherever we are, we have our gaps and we have to work with other people and other sections of rock. And so you can notice that at Grand Canyon. It takes a while, but what you see 
is that you come along and then you come boom, 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 boom. And there's several rocks and then there's a long gap and then there's more rocks. And the same happens all the way back through to the basement. So that's a little bit of a subtle thing that, you know, you were thinking about the exhibit and like, you've been here many times, you didn't really get maybe into it. Maybe you noticed a pretty rock here or there. Um, but for somebody who really wants to immerse and think about it, there's a lot in this exhibit that you don't notice at the first glance, but uh, it's pretty fun. And, I, and hopefully it doesn't distract people from just simply the beautiful view of the canyon if that's, if that's all they want. Hey, they don't have to mess with it. I think that's such a great perspective that you brought up is that, you know, there is this ability to still walk along this paved, pale, this paved trail and then look over and get these amazing scaping views but you have these little small tidbits of interpretation that can really help kind of enhance that education of while you're here. Um, but again, you can still enjoy it all together without being inside of a museum. I mean, that's what is so incredible about Grand Canyon is that it is like this living laboratory and it's something where you truly can experience what that geological history is without having to be inside. And don't we all want to be outside a little more? right now <laughs> exactly and bring people out and be confident about the distance you know compared to compared to walking in a mall really walking over to Vercamps is not is not that different so anyone can do that really you know of course you've got to be careful you probably have sunscreen a hat water comfortable shoes you used a bathroom when you were at one <laughs> those are the basics at Grand Canyon be sure you do all those things and then, then you can think about enjoying the view and uh, maybe learning a few new things along yeah. the way. You know, there can't always be a ranger with you, but there are ranger walks, which are terrific and informative and often kind of focusing on a particular aspect. You know, this, this exhibit is, uh, is kind of exhausting intellectually if you're trying to get, you know, everything out of it. Classrooms can come here, you know, as, as, you know, college geology classes bring people there. The junior ranger programs uh, come out and I think even Grand Canyon schools, uh, they bring the kids to certain parts of the trail, but they don't try to do the entire thing because it's a lot of different topics that you're, you're introducing when you come along the trail. Focusing on the basement rocks, what happens deep in the earth, that's kind of a fun exercise. And then the upper layers, you can think about the environments and the different fossils and the different life forms that were present at this part in Earth's history. So the stories in each of those rocks is very interesting. And the companion, uh, Carl did a little thing where he kind of wrote a paragraph from the point of view of each rock layer, like, hi, I'm the Cardenas lava. And then it talks about its <laughs> age and what, what it was like being the Cardenas lava. Yeah, I can try and pull up the booklet. Um, and I did just wanna, um, you know, before we wrap up too, just for people that really, if they have a passion like you in geology and have really been fascinated like this, do you mind just giving a quick overview of GeoFest? I know Sabine talked sure. about this too. Sure. Well, you know, I, I have to say I, I was super inspired by a uh, raider who took the lead at the park once there was dark sky status. You know, there's the uh, the Star Week, you know, where they they do the whole night sky thing as a special focused event. And so we were thinking, and we had a symposium at the Shrine of the Ages where we had speakers come in and talk about aspects of Grand Canyon geology um, in the fall during Earth Science Week. So that was pre-COVID, right? We did a in-person one-day thing in association with Earth Science Week. You guys also do, well, the, the, the park interpretive staff do a, um, do a paleontology day. So we've worked in the paleontology talks it, you know, in the same kind of a sequence. Well, then when COVID hit, Raider switched over and he said, hey, I'm gonna do a virtual star party. And so then I was like, hey, we need to do a virtual GeoFest <laughs> during <laughs> geoscience. Week. And so we got speakers and I think we overkilled it a teeny bit, as you can imagine, usually I'm, you know, full of, let's, let me talk longer. Hey, can we do this Facebook thing all day? Anyway, <laughs> um, so we did, we lined up speakers this was last fall during uh, Earth Science Week, and we had an evening programming, Facebook Live. It was on the Grand Canyon page, and so it's called GeoFest. And if you go to the Grand Canyon National Park page, you, you can find the link to their live events and the history, uh, or if you just Google GeoFest on that page, you'll come to 
these talks that you can hear by the active researchers, including Carl talking about different aspects, myself, people who are specialists on the paleontology, uh, people that are specialists on these different layers, uh, giving talks. And, and not just about the rock layers, but including uh, folks like Ron Blakey talking about how he does his his beautiful visual artistic plate reconstruction views for people. Uh, so we had all aspects of geology uh, kind of in those evenings. So there's seven, I think it's seven days worth of programming, probably more than anybody would reasonably want to listen to. <laughs> so you can go to those and there's a little summary of what the topics are. And uh, I think they might also be on the Grand Canyon YouTube page, but the easiest way to find it since these folks are on Facebook is just go to Facebook. And, find and I do want to um, just say, if you guys go in the comments, um, our good friends from Green Canyon National Park that we are so close with, just actually put the link in the comments. So I'll make sure I go back and pin that comment. So if you guys are interested in any of the GeoFest programs, you guys can access it from there. And, and Trish just had a comment too. I wish Dr. Crossy could do an on-site seminar for rock lovers uh, when the okay. world is normal. So Bring your hand lens. Bring your hand lens, Trish, and we will do that. Uh, Carl and I generally, where we are Grand Canyon Park volunteers, we come over and work with the interpretive staff, usually in the winters when there's not so much visitor pressure and we work and, you know, we bring interpreters out on the trail and, and then, um, you know, do an evening program or something like that. Yeah. But uh, even if maybe the conservancy, uh, Alyssa, maybe sometime if you're doing an event, you know, we, we come over from Albuquerque to Grand Canyon uh, when needed. So give us a call. Uh, we're pretty used to making that drive because believe me, when we were making this exhibit, we were, we had to be here all the time. <laughs> it definitely, you know, you guys have put a lot of your own hard work into this too. And, you know, I'm just curious when you guys are coming back and doing any of the kind of maintenance work that you and Carl work so hard on, do you guys do volunteers or do you guys kind of orchestrate any kind of group activities for that? Well, you know, I'm not 100% sure, you know, yeah, we could have, we, we could have done that when we were installing 2,500 markers. You want me to show you a picture of that drill? Should we try showing it? I think you should. Let's show the picture of the drill. And then if there's any last minute questions, I'll try and scroll through while you pull that picture up and then. Um... Yeah, I'm just going to show a couple of the funny pictures of, of the stuff we did. Maybe somebody on Facebook, if you guys are seeing uh, I'm going to go to, uh, first of all, uh, let me try this. I'm hoping that this is showing. It is. Live. Yep. Okay. I can so see it you, through my backup device. <laughs> yeah. So what you should be seeing once it catches up with me is you should be seeing Carl measuring a stone. He's down in the bottom of Grand Canyon. As you know, the Colorado River carves through the canyon. It starts up at Lee's Ferry and you're about, you're just above actually the level of the Kaibab. You float down through the Kaibab, Torweep, Coconino. You float through all these layers in Grand Canyon as you go down the river. So we measured these rocks. We, we didn't want to damage the resource where possible. We took beautiful specimens of the different rock types that were about the right size and we, we we got them uh, and then we had to carry them. Here's a rock stretcher. Here is the non-OSHA approved footwear worn, worn by rafters. Uh, and we are carrying rocks on litters. Literally a rock like this would weigh probably over 600 pounds. And so we couldn't take anything more than what uh, six people could, uh, could carry. Uh, but that's how we brought the rocks down to the rafts, which we then slabbed uh, and polished actually here in Berlin, New Mexico. Uh, Rocky Mountain Travertine is a local company here that really does that kind of work. And so they took care of the rocks. Here's what a boat looks like on the Colorado River. That's Joe Pollock, Arizona River Runners, and the NPS contributed what are called S-rigs, big burly boats with six tons of rock that we carried out. So you think it's challenging to go through the rapids? Try it with six tons of rock on your boat. Here we are oh in the God. rapid. You can barely see the 30 foot raft. It only had a few inches of freeboard. <laughs> we had to take them off over there at Lee's Ferry by Mead View. I don't even want to talk about the hazards involved with that. We had a park assist. Look at this daisy chain. This is literally tons of rock being carried by one heavy lift helicopter. We were in the other park medic helicopter. We went ahead of the heavy lift. 
we wrapped the rock in steel mesh with a, with a technician from the park and they picked up four big slings of the rocks, which became those beautiful seating rocks that you showed. So that was all fun. And then here's the busy end of it, literally drilling 2,500 holes for the bronze markers. We used the trail cruise equipment. Uh, this was a drill that we rented um, and we drilled through the asphalt. Each one uh, was filled with rockite and installed into the asphalt. And I had a lot of help from family members, many of whom are probably watching this and uh, kind of <laughs> laughing, remembering, remembering it. If you guys ever uh, had, had a, one of those plastic cups like you would drink, like say at a college party, if you were having a, a yeasty beverage in a plastic cup, that's about the amount of rock I No one there. knows what those are. <laughs> no, I'm sure you have no idea what I'm talking about. We're a wholesome group. <laughs> That's right. A plastic knife stirring up the rock height, And that was about how much each marker took. So we got into a like a John Henry kind of thing, like a railroad where Carl went ahead and drilled. Uh, we would follow behind making the rock height for each one. Uh, and then it would take about as long to set. He would get a few ahead of us. I think, the, I think that doing something like 40 or 60 uh, in a day was a lot. That was a lot of wow. miles to do. So, so it took us a long time to do that. Uh, you know how, have you ever seen the park or any large organization change its mind? <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, we have. That happens a lot. So, um, so now I'm, uh, I'm stopping the share just to come back to you, Alyssa. But one of the things was uh, we got a couple of calls, let's just say from some insiders saying, hey, you guys, you know, we've, we've invested a lot, a few years into this exhibit. You better come and install some of those markers and nail this exhibit down before somebody gets a genius idea about something else. So we took that clue. And before all the, the waysides and everything else were installed, we went out and we put the markers on the ground. If you want to call it staking out the turf, we staked out that turf over about a, I don't know, it was probably about a four month period. Uh, and then the rest of the exhibit stuff came. You know, they had to install these during the winter because these are so heavy. They were on a like a little tractor that they were afraid that it would actually indent the asphalt of the trail in the summer's wow. heat. So those parts were installed in the cool season. But we think for something that was installed in 2010, uh, it's still looking pretty darn good. And uh, we hope it stays and that, uh, that that gets, you know, the asphalt will have to be replaced. Some of these markers are being lost because asphalt just ages. When they redo the asphalt, we have to figure out what to do with the markers. I think the conservancy is, of course, a great way to help us uh, make sure that happens. So when, when the, when the call, call comes for the trail, let's do a conservancy event and talk about the trail and talk about its future. Yes, I think that's a great topic. And, um, you know, this is a great segue too. So if any of you guys are planning a trip back up and you guys haven't seen it yet, um, this is the incredible guide that has a lot of some of the photos that um, Lori just shared with us and great kind of informative component that really kind of, um, you know, the companion guide as I know what she called it. And just to help you if you can't have that ranger on site to do what we did today to walk this trail of time and to have that interpretive element there. So I just, got back up to the point here. And um, I just want to you know, say Alyssa, thank you. One, Alyssa, one more look across there to Maricopa Point. Notice that when you're on the trail of time near the beginning, that point is where the end of the early Earth Trail. I didn't really mention, you know, we go a million years back. We're, we're at a, a two billion years back at Vercamps. That's the age of the rocks at Grand Canyon. Of course, the age of the Earth is more than twice as long. And so we marked every 10 meters all the way out to Maricopa Point. And we're gonna get a meteorite out there because that's what happened at the age of the earth. Unfortunately, the park returned the meteorite that used to be in Vercamps. There used to be a piece of the Canyon Diablo, you know, meteor crater uh, there. Denver Museum is willing to loan one to the park, but they're a little nervous about the whole insurance thing. I, you know, these rocks, these beautiful rocks that we have here on the rock waysides have, have lasted, right, for more than 10 years. But, you know, meteorites are kind of a little bit special and the road is pretty close out there to Hermit. So they're, they're a little leery about uh, sticking a piece of a meteorite out there. But I think 
you know, for the educational purposes, that's a, a small risk against a really great reward to lay your hand on a meteorite after you've invested in walking. Yeah. Points, you know, five, six billion years, the age of the earth. An additional, you know, kind of concept there. I, I love it. So just want to give a huge shout out again to uh, Dr. Laura Crossy, thank you for joining us virtually today. Uh, you know, from University of Mexico, if you guys are seeing that logo at the bottom of the screen, yeah, that is where her, her knowledge is shared on a regular basis. And so we're so lucky that she was willing to share it with us. And, you know, I think this could be a whole other segment just talking about some of the construction photos that you had too. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty fun, but you know, yeah, or the different segments of time. And, you know, we didn't even really touch on the paleontology. You guys are doing a, the, the park is doing a major uh, upgrade of their paleontology, uh, both curation of the resource and interpretation in the paleontology area. So that is super exciting. There is some fun stuff coming. And so yeah. I just, let me flip it around. Um, for Thank those you, of you guys Krista. that joined us this afternoon, really appreciate your guys' ongoing support this week. Again, we are closing out National Park Week, um, our Trailblazer event, and Earth Week. So if you guys haven't had a chance to get outside and go for a nature stroll just in your neighborhood for Earth Week, we encourage you to do that. And if you guys are still interested in participating in our virtual Trailblazer event, you can. Um, you can donate to an existing team or you guys can sign up and register yourself still. I have my Trailblazer t-shirt on. Um, we're really excited to keep that momentum going. We're really close to that $20,000 mark um, that we raised for Grand Canyon. It is incredible. And so thank you guys that have already supported. That URL again is Grand Canyon or protect. Even I can't remember the URL. Protect.greencanyon.org forward slash Trailblazer. And I will continue to be sharing some updates I'll try and get over to the other portal by Vercamps by the time I leave the park today. And I'll post a picture in our Facebook stories. So that way you guys can oh, see okay. um, kind of the beginning and end there. Yeah, show but, them the oldest rock. Take a picture of the oldest rock, the Elves Chasm. Nice, it's a beauty. I'll make sure I do that before I leave today. So if you guys check back our stories this afternoon as a segue from this, and we'll make sure we post this to our Facebook page so you guys can go back and watch it from the beginning if you joined us late. Um, I'm gonna end with a view of the canyon. Thank you guys all so much for joining. Thank you. Lori, do you have any other last thoughts? No, except uh, you're going to have to help me uh, extricate myself from this so I don't consume your feed all day. <laughs> nope, you are totally fine. So what you'll want to do is just hit end live um, through the Zoom meeting. I will do that. So bye-bye and thanks, Alyssa, for inviting us. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Okay, bye.